It is an amazing feat of engineering. It speaks to the power of what we can do when things are truly urgent and we have to come together because we have no choice because it is a, it's a matter of survival. Dude, um, I got I got recognized the other day in a glossier. I was uh, I was sitting there, just hanging out with Sam. We're on a date day, and uh, I got recognized for a podcast. So my ego, like, it barely fit through the door. Just can we back up? Can mm -hmm. we back up? Mm -hmm. All right. What you got? Can you tell me, in descriptive and small words, <laughs> what a glossier is? <laughs> Can you tell me what one is and why you were there? <laughs> it was for my wife. She was buying makeup. It's gl glossier, all right? Gl glossier. Spelled glossier. Glossier. Okay. But it's a glossier. In the southern dialect. For the record, it's glossier because I'm classy You're like not. That. You're not actually. That's I'm what not makes classy. it humorous. But I still want to know what one looks like. I, <laughs> what? So you walk in, all right, and you're greeted by two teenage girls, all right? And they're like, hi, what are you looking for today? My wife is like, oh, I'm looking for makeup. It's something like that. I don't know. But they got like tables out where you could just walk up and like they've got samples of makeup that you could pick up and like try and stuff. So a lot of the ladies are like walking around, like finding different shades and different things that they like, different rouges and such. And, uh, but they set this store up really well. Okay. They set the store up great. They, uh, they put a little like half moon couch in there. It's like a really classy, like red couch. And, uh, do you so, have to put your pinky up when you sit on it? <laughs> you kind of feel like you do. Yeah. So they, they set the couch there for the dudes, like full stop. Like we know this, this is for the guys. This one's for the boys. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking around with Sam for like just a hot second. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm out of my element here. I'm gonna go sit down. So I go sit down and, uh, you know, so is the couch, the glossier? No, the couch is not the glossier. Okay. You're getting no, into that part it's just eventually a, here. Though. No, the glossier is the brand dude. It's not a type of makeup. All right. It's a brand called I glossier. A, I didn't think it was a type of makeup. I just thought it was like a booth or something. You said I'm in a glossier. Store. Like, in I'm a glossier store. You freaking moron. All right. So I'm in a makeup store. How about that? Is that better for you? Yeah, actually. Okay, there we go. That really helps me because I I'm don't keep up with makeup brands, particularly French ones. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> You're your high school, like your, your teenage uh, girl is going to give you all sorts of crap about this. Give them all sorts of crap, Sarah. You know what to Jeez. do. Anyway, so we're in the glossier, glossier, and I go <laughs> over and I sit down on the couch. So I'm this is like being in an Aeropostale. Basically. I'm yeah. in a gap. I'm in a gap. All right. I'm a, I'm only a fancier. I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a strange world. <laughs> I'm in a strange world. So I'm moving on. So I go sit down. And, you know, I, we do the bro nod, right? Because there's another guy in there. He's hanging out and he's uh, he's waiting on his wife too. And so, you know, we, we do the, what's up? How's it going? You know, okay. just like we go sit on different ends of the couches because, you know, that's what we do, right? Leave room for Jesus is what we call that, that's right? That's right, yeah. So we left some room for Jesus and we're sitting there. We're hanging out and stuff. <laughs> and then he looks over and he's like, hey, uh, are you are you Tyler? And I was like, you, you better stop it right now. Immediately, my wife whips around after he says that and she starts going, oh crap, we're not going to be able to fit his head in the car. So immediately my ego was starting to get deflated, which is fine. I don't care. I need that guys. I need that full, full disclosure. But Hey, listen, met a new friend of the show, Nathan Lemieux, shout out. He's down from Cincinnati hanging out and, uh, he was going over to the podcast show, which we went to. Yeah. And, uh, it was hilarious. Like, it's so fun, like doing this show because you realize, like, kind of how small, like, the world is. Like, people are connected to each other that, that you would never, you would never expect. Yeah. And so, like, it, it was so cool. Like, he's working up at Miami University, and you know, he knew of Pop uh, through some other colleagues of his. Knows Chris Mealy, so yeah. we got a shout out Chris on the show too. 
and uh, working with Messer Construction. I'm sorry, guys. Like, I swear to you, this this show is not sponsored by Messer. We just have so many times. <laughs> there's just a lot of Messer. Family. Yeah, there's a it's lot ridiculous. of It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, shout out to the Messer crew and uh, Nathan, man. It was, it was good to meet you, dude. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. That, that's not it. We did need to take a moment. We did need to take a moment. Mainly for Glossier. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Full stop. I did just learn that that was a, a makeup brand. I okay. did not. That's there's not an act. Here's a secret here. All right. Here's 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 a fun fact for you. Fun factoid. You know who taught Sam how to say that word? No. Me. Really? Yeah. She called it glossier. She called glossier. Are you? I well, said, honey. You just admitted it's that glossier. On the yes, I did. Yes, I did. I listened to a uh, How I Built This episode and the founder called it Glossier. So, hey, I'm cultured, guys. Hey, you know what? Stick around. You might learn something. I'm going to quote That's right. Wesley from The Princess Bride. <laughs> I do not envy the headache that you're going to have in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say about okay. that. All right. Anyway, moving on to the Mulberry Harbor thing, which I am epically excited about because once again what? we're returning to a historically <laughs> we construction from, process thing i love the pivot we're making here we're going from a makeup brand to ww2 Qu all right quickly back to the history pivot so back to the history stuff i want i want it to be noted who wanted to talk about what too <laughs> <laughs> just, so, yes please he for, did for the he record did. for he the did. record books he did all right okay all right tell us about mulberry harbor eddie <laughs> what is there to know about mulberry harbor and how in the heck does it relate to construction get into it man Go. i i found out about these things i have no idea how just my meanderings and um meanderings on the interwebs my, my meanderings of various historically uh, inclined oh, YouTube crap, channels you've, and podcasts. You've, you've got papers and, and stuff. I've got like papers. You, you've actually like done your research and I stuff. Like a, a actually, night, no, I you've like not done your research. How mm -hmm. much of that did Lee write? Okay. Because uh, Lee, Lee but, Dalma is the, but, he's our researcher. All but that. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> three pages so, worth of things that I did not write. <laughs> and then... We can't take my summary. Hey, man, I'm not. T I'm not letting you take credit from Lee on this. All I right? absolutely will not take credit from Lee because he did some epic research here. Also, cited a very nice YouTube uh, channel that I got to watch and okay, okay, learned a lot. What's the, so, what's the name of the channel? Give him a shout out. I, I don't know that. Okay, I mean, never mind. Never let's, mind. No shout out for you, YouTube little, channel. Let's see. <laughs> uh, the channel is called um, Key Source Video. Key That's, Source Video. Cool. Anyway, it's all right. just a blue link in the, <laughs> but it's not blue on the paper. You can't click it <laughs> on the pen. <laughs> anyway, all right. Go to YouTube for that one. Um, may or may not be funny. It just could be sad. All right. We got to get into this, Joker. Freaking and boomer. Man, all right. Go on. Move. I'm, I'm not a boomer. <laughs> You're a boomer. That was a boomer move right there. Move on. I'm Come on. Mulberry Harbor. Let's get into it's it. It's a joke, Tyler. Stop. All right. So, D Day, World War II just to get out of the makeup thing. You can't get more manly than D-Day and World War II. Let's go. Okay, let's, let's go. go. That's All right. right. Yeah. All right, so you got D-Day, World War II, and the Allied invasion of France, where we get you know, our troops onto mainland France, and we begin the advance that will eventually end the war, mm -hmm. end World War II. And so just this, this point in history that is... Well, it's a hinge. Mm -hmm. It's a hinge for the war in so many ways. And just a, a really interesting thing to look back on. Uh, obviously, a lot of media surrounding that with Ben yeah. Brothers, with Saving Private Ryan, with various other things that you see. Uh, they even uh, they commemorate D-Day every yeah. year in northern France. Um, if you're not familiar with the geography, the, the invasion happened where... It was basically staged in England, mm -hmm. and then you had to get a lot of troops, to say a lot of troops, hundreds of thousands, across the English Channel, yeah. which is not a small body of water. Yeah. And you had to get them across the English Channel, and then we had, you know, we, we invaded the beachhead, and we got onto the mainland, and we start working our way inland. Mm -hmm. Well, there was, a, there was a problem. And the problem was, like, we've got, you, you need large boats to get across a large body of water. And large boats have a, what they call a deep draft, a, a lot of boat under the water. 
Thanks, okay. thanks for that. You're welcome. Thank, I, I'm not going all glossy. I'm, <laughs> I'm, so a lot of, a lot of boat under the water, Tyler. There's, there's a, boat under the water. So there's boat under the water and too. And that boat could hit land. If it gets too close to the beachhead, then it's going to run aground and yeah. you don't go anymore. My that, understanding is that's, that's, that's not good. That's not good. That's yeah. a good understanding. Okay. All right. So, um, and I, I want to, I want to read through a few numbers. Uh, okay. There were a total of 129,400 Allied infantry troops that landed in Normandy. Uh, 54,000 infantry troops from the United States, 54,000 infantry troops from Britain, and 21,400 infantry troops from Canada. Hmm. Um, the airborne troops totaled 23,400. That means that we dropped 23,400 men out of airplanes <laughs> that day. Um, casualties were were very high immense yeah um there were there were there's one shy of 4000 casualties in the allied airborne troops alone um, by the end of june yeah. approximately 858000 troops and 150000 vehicles had to land or had landed on the beachhead at normandy in france Logistically, now we're going to go construction on this. Logistically, you think about bringing these very large ships that have a lot in them, mm -hmm. men, vehicles, supplies. <laughs> Resources. Yeah, yeah. you've got to resource the troops. You know, you, you break the supply lines. This is bad. So you've got to continue that resourcing. Yeah. And that's coming over. It's really from the United States into England because England got pounded to, to that point. Yeah, yeah. And then from England over into France. And, and so to bridge that gap, so to speak, to try to get, um, something larger than you see those Higgins boats, you know, the, the ones that drop the front and yeah, you see the yeah, men walking yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are like, they have a very flat bottom and there was mm -hmm. like a larger version of that, the LST, which was like a landing ship tank, I believe, okay. um, that comes in and you've got a, a shallow draft, a front that drops down yeah. and like tanks drive out. Mm-hmm. Well, you can imagine driving a big ship, a ship big enough for a tank and trying to master like the tides, trying to get right. there when like, all right, tides down and you drop the front and it's like, oh, tides coming back in. We got to unload, got to unload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you get there when the, the tide is high and you're just waiting. Yeah. So a lot of logistical stuff. Mulberry harbors were the invention of engineers that surrounded this invasion that would help people to get... Um, kind of a halfway point. It's like a stopping off point, right? So I'm going to transfer um, from a, a very large ship onto a, basically a, a built pier, mm -hmm. a, a built port almost, that will allow me to put the resources off and then drive on like a lengthy bridge all the way into shore. And if you, and we will, I'm sure, uh, show some of these images on the YouTube version of this, if you would look at these bridges and how extensive and lengthy they are, it's pretty amazing. And they're rocking and rolling in the ocean and you've got, you know, a truck going down this joker. Yeah. So um, you've got this whole like construction and engineering problem and you have to solve it in a way that um, is is fast to assemble because we can't, it's not like you can show up and start building with a bunch of sticks on a like, sneak attack. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like the Germans knew we were trying to stage this, but yeah, this counter offensive that we're coming at them with is like, we didn't want them to know. Right. right? Yeah. So we've got to like invade and then show up very quickly thereafter. And the construction has to happen. Like, boom, it's got to happen. Yeah. So what do you do? Prefab. Prefab, bodge <laughs> your eyes. You do things that are going to help you when you get there. You're not just going to show up with a bunch of concrete and sticks and say, oh, well, I guess we'll work it out. Be it to fit, paint it to match. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're going to plan, yeah. like plan and plan and plan. Yeah. And so very interesting stuff. Uh, you even had to figure out like, where are we going to put them? Mm. And so there were two, uh, two harbors that were planned, Mulberry A and Mulberry B. One was for the United States. Okay, so this is Omaha. harbors. Okay, harbors, so there's multiple yes, harbors. Okay, multiple. all right. So there were two of them that were made. Um, one of the big things that they had to get by was breakwaters. Like, so have you been near like maybe down in Savannah or Charleston? You yeah. kind of see where uh, you'll have 
Well, take for instance, like maybe you've seen a jetty. Like yeah, it, it goes yeah. out and kind of breaks the water mm -hmm. and makes it calm where a ship can come in. Yeah. That was a, a necessity. You've got to make the waters more calm around a pier or you're not going to be able to dock at it and right. do anything. Yeah. Somebody's going to get hurt. Stuff's going to get broken. So they had to build jetties. So they had to, they had to build breakwaters. And so they did that um, multiple ways. They, uh, they built, they built concrete ships. Like they actually built like almost like concrete boats of varying sizes. Yeah. Um, and these breakwaters, just for point of reference, how many people it took and how many people they brought in for these 20,000 people over 150 days for this work. <laughs> That's a project. That's a project. Um, and of all different walks of life and all different levels of skill. So yeah. some of the concrete that got poured in these things was just like no good, but this was a little bit fast and loose. We just got to get it done. Some of these things, like they didn't really get used, like they didn't float, mm -hmm. but ideally this thing would kind of look like a boat. It would have like various compartments. And those compartments could be filled with water. And this thing could be submerged or brought up yeah. and made different levels of buoyant based on how much water it had in it. That reminds me of the ship shipping ship. Have you seen those? No. <laughs> it's a ship shipping ship. It. Okay. So look it up, guys. Look it up. We can probably put a picture on the YouTube version. Uh, ship shipping ship. <laughs> it's literally, it will submerge itself hmm. and they can pull a ship on top of the ship and then it lifts from there because they just basically eject all the water out. You see that with the, the barging of very large loads yeah. for industrial construction as well. Like yeah, yeah. very large modulars, modular constructed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's like, I don't know. I don't think Mulberry is probably the origin of that sort of I thing. Know. Probably not. That would be a fun little research project. Hey Lee, put, put that one on your list. That'd be pretty I, interesting. I don't think it is <laughs> okay. at all. We're getting but... into nautical history now, guys. This is the Nautical Brothers podcast. All right. We're changing, <laughs> well, we're changing our name. To break into that, have you ever seen the Titanic and how- Yes, like, I did see the movie. Mm -hmm. No, like any of the, the historical studies, like there were multiple compartments that- could have overflowed in the Titanic and it still would have floated. Y yeah. But yeah. you see how they, it filled up to a point where one too many compartments got full. And the pressure and just, it went, yeah, and it right. went down. Yeah. Um, so this is a compartmentalized ship much in that same way. Interesting. Okay. Uh, but they, they built these and they went out and sank them in order to act as a breakwater to just try to settle things in. Uh, really interesting and you can look up the video on this but they actually came up with a pneumatic means of stilling the water at one point so rather than construct these large large concrete ships yeah in a big hurry yeah they would go through and they would <laughs> they put like a pipe filled with air mm -hmm. underneath the water and allow the bubbles to come up and the bubbles would disrupt the wave patterns. The wave patterns would disrupt each, each other and you would get stiller water, calmer water on what? one side as a result of the bubble bubbles. Release. Yeah, yeah, it was a, adding it was air a to bubble the bubble breakwater. So, but that was deemed like too much energy because it, it was an insane amount of energy to create. Makes, yeah, that makes sense. That much that much air you yeah, know, to, right. to compress, move, and release. Yeah. So anyway, interesting <laughs> That's <there>. fascinating. <laughs> Another way that was more simple, and they call these, the code name for this was corn cob. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, uh, yeah, that's right? a good code name right there. <laughs> All right, so. Um, the corn cob. <laughs> the, the good old corn cob. I want to say that was on Mulberry B. It was corn cob. Um, but they they basically took old ships out at one point and, and sunk the ships. They would take yeah. large, old, like it was well known that the U.S. had an, an aging uh, naval fleet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Took some of them out there so, and said, I ain't right. using it. <laughs> In some instances, the men would be on them. What? Yes. So they would have them manning the ship. The, the ship would continue to be manned. They would detonate. Underneath and underneath, then it would start to go. And the thing would come down and rest on the ocean floor and act as a breakwater against these harbors. What? Yes. So very, very <laughs> cool stuff. I just imagine like the, the briefing that's happening on that. Like, hey, Jimmy, why don't you hop on that boat 
and uh, it's going to have a bunch of TNT on it. And yeah, be, he's don't like, worry about it. Don't don't worry about it. All right. <laughs> Just put your life vest on. It'll be fine. All right. <laughs> Just, I, I don't want to go, man. <laughs> I don't want to go. I, I love a lot of the 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 things that we've brought out uh, in the research here. Right. Um, so the essence of this is like they, they call them Liberty ships, but the essence was to get things off of Liberty ships, which was supplies, men, tanks, mm -hmm. equipment from England to France. So the next part of this after the breakwaters, which was a whole construction process in and of itself was now we need to actually create the thing that floats that the ship can come up next to and put things off on, and then we can wheel it to shore. The pier, basically, right. right? The thing that floats has to react to the tides. The thing that floats has to be able to react to the waves. Yeah. The thing that floats has to have a bridge that comes off of it that goes all the way into shore. And if you look at the maps for some of these bridges, I mean, they're insanely long. Yeah. And so, and they have to <laughs> How be- How long are they? They have to be constructed about a, as long as a man. About as long <laughs> <laughs> Braveheart reference. <laughs> anyway, so moving right along. Please go. <laughs> please, move, <laughs> please move on. All right. Okay. I'm good. Are you, are you though? No. Are you? I'm not, not good. <laughs> if you know the reference, you know the reference, guys. Go, go look. We'll make sticks as long as a man. <laughs> Holy cow. All right. Well, we're good. With that, the bridges would have to be connected into end. And so what you ended up with was a what I'll call like a a steel truss mm -hmm. or two parallel steel trusses. And those two trusses had to relate to each other, but be able to kind of like move and shift against each other. Yeah. If you can imagine how a wave would want to move and and break right. that bridge. Yeah. Um, and also the like the the piers themselves, um, they'd have to be secure. They'd have to rise and fall with the tides. They'd have to rise and fall with the waves. And they basically came up with a stilt design so yeah. these things would come out and they would sit them on stilts and that was kind of like the basis of um where the ships would would put their stuff off mm -hmm. they and the stilt would hold the thing up just a little bit higher than the wave levels yeah to just re reduce some of the wave action yeah off of that you would get these bridge pieces these these piers and under these piers you would have these things called beetles all right so and, and then you'd have connection points. So yeah. some fun facts here. Um, these these piers were capable of up to, get this, 40 degrees of roll. Good Lord. So they could they could roll up and, and but they're sustain. But they're all interlocked, right? Everything's interlocked, but they could sustain. It was like 40, 40 degrees on an axis, right? Yeah. To, to where you could almost like take that thing and twist it. Yeah. But then it was like 28 degrees against each other to huh. where the joints came together. Yeah. And picture like I've built I built a little bridge and then it's got four connection points at, at its end. And those connection points connect at these little like what they're calling beetles, but like um, almost like it's where the knuckle would sit. And yeah. the knuckles are kind of these, this spherical connection point. Almost reminded me of like a – a trailer hitch yeah, or something. They yeah. even had like chains that they would throw in for a secondary reinforcement just well, I mean, in case yeah, that- Yeah, for a trailer hitch. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, right? It's so kinda... they would move about that sphere. Right. Um, and and those beetles basically uh, held them together. And then that was all modularized. So <laughs> they would modularize it so that like, let's say we didn't measure- from exactly, because you know exactly, exactly where the piers would sit. Right. Um, you would go from there to the shore and just keep plugging until you got to where you needed to get. Yeah. Um, very interesting is that as they were like setting up for the breakwaters and setting up for the piers, they actually went out at night. Like there was a whole mission 
just to figure out and get um, depth, basically depth sounds to, to take uh, topo of the ocean. Jeez. So they actually did a whole topographic map of the ocean floor to, to figure out where to put this. So there was pre-construction study, there was design and engineering concept, there was implementation of modular design, pre, you know, the prefabrication of that design, mass workforce involvement and engagement, and then on top of all that, it had to be top secret. And you're probably getting shot at in most cases and like, or in some cases, well, I guess you've driven back a lot of the these enemy at that offshore. point, yeah, right? These aren't like, I'm not putting these like right on, on the beach. These are so that I can be a little bit off of the beach. Now I'm oh, not okay. saying that they could never be shot at. Even some of those, um, the concrete boats I'm talking about, You're right. were outfitted with like turret guns on top of my anti-aircraft guns Jeez. so that they could be used as anti-aircraft. Well, I mean, stations. aircraft I think would probably be Probably your main thing. You're, you're probably safe from infantry at that point. Aircraft uh, yeah, attacks aircraft, probably a little like more common. Yeah, maybe they're going to fire artillery back or whatever. But um, these things come in and um, really in a matter of, we'll say 12 days, they have these things like in and partially functioning. Wait, 12, so... I did, I did, I never got that. So as the attack the, happens, what the attack happens? Yeah, you know, obviously these aren't there before the attack. Of course, yeah. Now, as soon as the attack happens, these come in behind them, and they start to construct these. And from that point uh, to like the nineteenth, um, so let's let's read a few dates from uh, Lee's research. Uh, actual construction of the harbor begins on June 6th, on D-Day. Okay. Then by June 11th, the breakwaters from Mulberry A are complete. <laughs> by June 18th, the piers are in place and they begin unloading cargo from them on Mulberry A. Mulberry B is a little farther up off of Gold Beach, which is the mm -hmm. lesser known beach. Um, by June 19th though, something horrible happens and there's a storm. It's the worst storm that they have seen in 40 years. And that storm comes through with very large waves, four and a half meters, whatever that means. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, and so. <laughs> meters. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to anybody listening from not America. <laughs> um, but we are in the Just proving our ignorance here. That's right. <laughs> But I mean, you can yeah. see that uh, by, by, nine, by the 19th, uh, Mulberry A is wiped out. Mulberry B uh, actually takes a little bit longer. And so it's, it's not constructed quite as fast, but Mulberry B is the one that's actually completed and used for longer. So huh. Mulberry B is supplying the British beach and a lot of what, you know, whatever B, they could sell. for British. There you go. A for America. A, A for America. I'm sure they planned that that way. Probably right? so. Yeah. And uh -huh. then, so by the time, <laughs> um, you know, A gets wrecked out, uh, they they basically start bringing over uh, some of the elements, um, the whales, which would be um, the long piers. Right. They're, they're called whales. Whales. I'm I'm not sure. I look. Try googling whales and beetles. It, and it's, you're not going to get you, this. This isn't just going to come right up. So yeah. kudos to Lee for this. Um, but by the end of October, 40,000 vehicles and almost 250,000 personnel had passed along through this port. Um, an average of 7,000 tons of supplies are, are coming through every single day. <laughs> uh, continue to serve as a port Jeez. for equipment and personnel needed in actions in Southern France until closed in December of 1944. So from June to December, these were operational. Um, there's some argument over whether these were necessary. And there's some argument over whether they were helpful and useful. Of course there is. There will always be that sort of thing as we look back on decisions. But it is an amazing feat of engineering. Um, it speaks to the power of what we can do when things are truly urgent. And we have to come together because we have no choice mm -hmm. because it is a, um, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of, um, the good of, of humanity. Yeah. And also 
I, I think there's probably more of a deep dive here that we could go into about the, the construction related processes like that would probably keep us here a very long time. Very, very long time. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to say that design phase load estimates <laughs> are almost always low. <laughs> like, yeah. I, like we under, we tend to understate a lot of times. Um, why do we do that? Well, we, we want to spend as little as possible. Uh, steel was an obviously scarce commodity mm -hmm. during this period of time. So it's like, eh, do we need that much? Yeah. It's one of the reasons why they built concrete boats. It's because steel There's is a lot more available. Yeah. The steel is a, is a commodity. So it's just a lot of um, a lot of practicality that drove this to be. And a it's an engineering feat. It's it's really quite the wonder that they brought it all together. And another historical example of modular construction when it was done very well, and um, I'll say very well, was done very urgently and successfully. I love I love this stuff, man. Because I, again, I just I beat this drum all the time. It's we act like this stuff is new, like we act like prefab's new. And all right, well, there's another example again, like we talked about Crystal Palace, another one where prefab is just there and it's it's shining. Yeah, it's I, there's nothing new under the sun. In so a lot this of is cases, ninety right? years after Crystal Palace. Crazy man, right? and. You got to wonder. Crystal Palace had already burned down by, by this point. By this point, because I think it was 1930. I could be fact checked on that. I think it was in the 1930s is when it burned down. After it had been moved. Yes. <laughs> after it had been. Moved. After it had been in moved. under 24 months. In under 24 months. Yeah. So historically speaking, I think that we need to pay homage to our predecessors yeah. and not get too uh, high and lofty about Got the things me. that we do. The, it's so unreal to me, like the design process that goes into it and just thinking through like they didn't have computer modeling at the time, man. Like they, they did not make this stuff in 3D and then build it in a really nice fab shop or something. No. Like it, you had people with freaking rulers <laughs> sketching this out and, and like drawing out every detail and like they they knew their craft there was I'm, I'm sure a lot of unknowns in this whole project like a lot of things are like eh, i'm not really sure so they may have had to build a couple prototypes i'm sure but it's insane to me the capability of just like again yeah humans when they're when they're under pressure and it's like yeah our lives kind of depend on this like we need to we need to move. Other people's lives are depending on this too. Um, I don't know. I, it's just always fascinating to me that things got done to that level of detail just without, without software. But, but, and I, I come from the background of doing things in 3D too. Mm -hmm. Like that's all I've ever known is modeling things in 3D and drawing them uh, and detailing them from a 3D model. That's not what they were doing. And that just, that's just mind boggling to me, the complexities of it and all of the foresight that you have to have of like, if I change this, there's going to be a ripple effect from here all the way through. A lot of times the modeling software just takes care of that ripple, right? A lot of times, <laughs> Some, sometimes it goofs it up. Um, I don't know. It's yeah, it's just fascinating. I'll take an example, like a, a structural analysis software that is um, coming up with the basics of a, a beam and column design. Right. Um, and, you know, I could, I could go in and try to design for the lightest possible structure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by doing that, allow it to um, run off with the, oh, I don't need an 8 by 12 there. I need an 8 by 10. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and up and down, up and down, and up and down. Yeah. And older designs, you'd have been a lot more likely to see something specified that was just going to hold true, right? I'll find what works. My worst case uh, being for a, you know, maybe eight foot span. I, I design in increments. I design mm -hmm. for commonality. I design for repeatability. I simplify. Yeah. And 
Computers simplify complex problems. They do. But computers also make simple problems more complex at times. <laughs> Mulberry Harbors were a great example of just having to sit and think about how can we make this repeatable? Mm -hmm. how, can I, how can I do something that I'm going to be able to stretch across thousands of feet and as little time as possible where I can prefab as many of these over on the shore here where I can move them. I mean, like every little thing, just the transport of these. Yeah. You really have to think through and you design the crud out of one module. Yeah. Design, design, design. And just the economies and efficiencies that you can get, like you just squeeze every last drop out of that one and you repeat it. And in some ways, the the repeatable object dictates the outcome. <laughs> yeah. And we do that because two by fours or a six inch thud or a brick or anything else that's modular in nature dictates outcome. How do I put a wall together? Well, I'm not out there casting, you know, bricks that are an inch thick. I understand that I've got three and a half if I got a brick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand I got seven to five eighths if I've got CMU. I understand that I've got three and a half if I got a two by four. Well, I'm going to use those and I'm going to repeat that. Modular construction, if we're really going to get serious about prefabrication and thinking through for kitting and thinking through for, you know, designing for manufacturing. We need to understand that repeatability thing and understand that the outcome may be moderately controlled by that repeatable object. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I, I know as we productize this a little more and we know about those products, we'll start to design around those products. Yeah. So this is a process and it goes back and forth. But um, I do think there's something to be said for recognizing how, how we solve a large and complex problem through simple and, and repeatable processes. Guys, it, like there's so much extreme intellect that went into that. You, just mind numbing intellect that went into making that happen. And so just before you think that we're the smartest generation ever, <laughs> this is a simple reminder, guys, they were doing it with rulers. <laughs> like, I can't even talk. <laughs> they, they're building this crap. <laughs> like, they're building this junk with rulers, and cool. we have we have all of this amazing tech, and we can't get our crap together. And that and not that's not to say that that went all perfect and everything. But twelve freaking days says it went pretty dang well. It, yeah, it went it went pretty well. Uh, it's You're very right. unfortunate that the thing that they they worked for so long on got dismantled, got destroyed <laughs> yeah. by a storm at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, but uh, you still had one out of the two and um, I don't know, the, the pre-planning I think is the thing that was the key to success. Yeah. So beating that drum one more time, <laughs> you know, that, that planning was what enabled any success had out of the Mulberry Harbors. If you fail to plan, Plan to fail. Plan to fail. There you go. There you go. All right, guys. Well, uh, there's Mulberry Harbors. Dude, that is a, that's a really cool story. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to, thanks for Lee to digging that up and, you know, putting a lot of meat on the bone for us to have this discussion. And also thanks for, for digging into it a little bit, brother. I know, I know that wasn't very hard for you though. Oh, this is labor love. This th is very cool. That's, it's so much fun. Yeah. I mean, that was, it was the way I felt on like Crystal Palace too. I'm like, I've been, oh man, I've been dying to oh, talk about this. Really awesome. Finally getting the chance to do it. And uh, so, yeah, let us know what you think. Let us know, let us know what other cool construction projects in history that we might ought to look at that you're curious about. Maybe we could go do some research and do an episode on it talk through some of the processes, share some of the historical facts and things that you may not have known. Uh, save you the Google search. We'll just be able to cut up and share the information with you. <laughs> just like this. Well, there you have it, guys. 
go build something awesome. 